Most like almost a spectacle. <laughs> By the way, I'm supposed to take part in a conference on Hello, the everybody. in February in, uh, at your university. Oh, I'd yeah, like to begin I'm our discussion sure. on the global science outlook, which I, uh, I hope you have all been looking forward to as keenly as I have. Um, I have quite a distinguished panel of speakers here with me today. Um, starting at my left, Tan Chor Chuan, president of National University of Singapore. Um, next to him, Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, president of the European Research Council. Um, Chen Zhanlang, vice president of the China Association for Science and Technology, People's Republic of China, welcome. Um, Dr. Thomas Insel, director of the National Institute of Mental Health from the United States. And um, um, Minister Ichida Yamamoto, recently of um, Science and Technology and Minister of Space Policy of Japan. Thank you and welcome. I'm also joined um, by our topic champion, who's, I just want to ask you, Michael, to raise your, your hand there, uh, Michael Siegel of Nautilus, who may uh, further challenge us when it comes time to the, for the discussion period with some uh, interesting thoughts and perspectives on science. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to speak about the global science outlook. And this is a particularly um, propitious time to be discussing this here. And science, of course, is the engine of innovation. And at this meeting, which is the eighth annual meeting of the um, new champions here in China, is especially devoted for the first time to science, technology, and innovation. And for that reason, maybe a, a particularly exciting time to discuss these issues with this panel, which which will um, describe and discuss trends and challenges around the state of science. And we'll also take a, a, a bit of a look ahead and have some questions uh, from the audience as well. If you want to send questions via Twitter, you can send them with the hashtag global science. So if you look up on the screens there, you can see uh, tweets as they come in. And I have, have one here as well in front of me so I can see your questions. If you don't like Twitter, which is fine, um, you may also send an email to globalscience at wef.ch. So you can send an email there for questions as well. So either hashtag globalscience or globalscience at wef.ch. So the charge, um, and by, I, I meant to say, my name is Mariette De Cristina. I'm the editor in chief of Scientific American. And um, I, I think the, the main charge of the panel today is to talk about how science community can generate further value for society. And I think a great way to begin would be to get a couple of minutes of, a minutes of perspective from each of the speakers here on uh, what the situation looks like in their country or their region. Would you please start? Yes. Uh, so I start with because Singapore, of course, is the smallest country. But, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we have to think a lot more strategically about how we uh, develop our R&D system. i just share three quick points uh, from a review which is still going on. The first is uh, we need to continue a strong focus on basic investigative research. And, uh, this is very important for the reasons of uh, attracting, nurturing and retaining talent, but also in creating a brain trust. A brain trust that allows you greater <coughs> flexibility to explore new areas of uh, innovation and also a absorptive capacity in order to connect with uh, the research community around the world and thereby access uh, the science that's being developed. So, so a strong focus on basic science. <coughs> At the same time, we have to try our best to realize the full value of the research that we do. And uh, broadly speaking, you can classify it as producing health, producing wealth, or producing influence, uh, for example, on <laughs> policy. And the, the main question, of course, is how do you do that? How do you bridge between the basic science strengths that you build and the creation, the realization of value? And here, uh, Singapore is focused on a number of strategies, including cooperative grants that bring multidisciplinary teams together from across the country and with international partners, working very closely with uh, industry partnerships uh, to create uh, consortia. And we also have a... Uh, mission-oriented research organization, the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, which sits between the interface of academic research and industry. Thank you. Dr. Bourguignon. Thank you. Well, um, I'm going to present a picture viewed from uh, Brussels, the, where the European Commission is sitting. And actually, we're entering a period which is uh, typical of the uh, European system, where the, more or less the financing is fixed for seven years. So 
The new program, which is called Horizon 2020, is uh, valid for the period 2014 to 2020. It's, uh, this program is quite uh, different from the previous one in the sense that it has been organized to really cover both uh, the fundamental side of science up to very uh, areas which really are corresponding to societal challenges. So actually, there are three pillars. The first pillar is excellent science. The second pillar is uh, industrial leadership. And the last pillar is societal challenges. And uh, the ventilation of uh, budget is roughly uh, one third, one third, one third, which is not exactly correct. The European Research Council sits <coughs> in excellent science. It's 17% uh, of the overall budget. The amount of money which uh, I'm talking about for this seven year period is substantial. It's 77 billion euro. So it's uh, over about uh, $85 billion for seven years. So it's a substantial amount of money. And uh, definitely the, the whole point of this new program being more readable, because you, you see more where you, you sit, uh, there's still room for, I mean, I would say, basic science in the, uh, both industrial leadership and the um, societal challenges. But really the main focus has been really European Research Council. And uh, the new feature of the European Research Council, which was created only in 2007, is really uh, actually two main things. The first one is this strictly bottom-up process. That is, the, we receive proposals by researchers, and we just let them go, and uh, we just evaluate them and decide which one we want to support. The only criterion is um, the quality, scientific quality of the project submitted. And uh, then the, the next point is, of course, uh, Clearly, in the, what I described, the, the key element will be the selection process, and then the scientific council is both responsible for how the money is spent, but also uh, choosing the people who make the selection. So, of course, that's uh, actually a substantial amount of work because uh, we have 25 uh, areas, and uh, actually it means uh, more than 2,000 scientists to be mobilized, and we have to find something at 400 to 500 a year, so it's a substantial number. Um, so this is uh, the way the European Union is considering, but of course the key element, which for the moment, uh, if I'm allowed to be a bit critical about the whole system, is not really functioning, this has to be articulated with what happens country by country. Mm -hmm. For the moment the mechanism for this is not really clear, and I hope as President of ERC that we will make progress in this coordination between what happens at the European level, which is more or less fixed, with f f little variation, but not much, and what can happen at uh, individual countries. And I must say that uh, at the level of individual countries recently, of course, in connection with the financial crisis, there have been a number of negative tendencies in terms of uh, not offering positions or b b freezing positions, also diminishing the support, also, um, also all of a sudden suppressing completely bottom-up uh, financing of research in some countries. And uh, this is very important that the countries really agree on uh, at, at least some minimal actions uh, in relation with uh, really bottom-up uh, research because the overall budget that the European Commission puts, if you sum up all the money devoted to research in Europe, is really uh, something like 8%. Uh, so, of course, if uh, the other part is missing, in the end you are going to miss uh, the, the, the right support. So I think we are very proud that the ERC has been able in a very short period of time, seven years, to establish itself as a reference program, uh, considered as an excellent program. So people who get ERC grants are really very well recognized, very often with a big push in their career. But uh, that's not enough because uh, the success rate is about 10%. So clearly there are many excellent scientists which are missing this. So we need, they need to be supported nationally in a good way and not only through uh, top-down research. So this overall balance for the moment is uh, a bit uh, complicated to, to monitor and to understand. In my new position, I do meet ministers regularly. It's difficult for me to know exactly how we can discuss this because, of course, I have absolutely no power on them. It's completely normal. Mm. But um, whether they will be willing to listen or not, that's something which needs time to be measured. Thank you. Dr. Chen. Yeah, my name is Chen from China Association of Science and Technology. Uh, after 30 years, uh, such a rapid development in economy in China, we are facing a kind of a very severe challenge in country. How to continue to make sure that continue uh, rapid economy development. So therefore, um, as our premier uh, Li Keqiang mentioned yesterday that the country invests lots of money uh, in research and development, R&D, research and development, try to push the new technology into a uh, market. Mm -hmm. 
And so far that uh, we are quite happy. I'm a scientist, but I'm happy about that the things being done in China. Uh, for example, number one, that uh, the total budget to R&D, they increase, increased dramatically in past couple of years. Uh, to last year, total investment in R&D in China has reached to 1.18 trillion RMB. This is about uh, 200 billion US dollars, just for R&D. That make about 2.03% of total GDP. This is the highest in our history, country history, that reached to 2% of GDP to uh, science and technology, uh, R&D. We are happy about that. So uh, the outcome so far that we can see, the, we can see the, the achievement in country. Uh, one data to show you that in year 2000, the total exports, goods from China exports, the high technology products, the value, just about like a 6.5%. But to last year, uh, year 2013, the total exports, the high tech, high tech products, among the total, pro total exports products, the value, we reach to 30.6%. So 36.5%, uh, the increase 30%. We are happy about that situation, that the technology being applied in the marketing area. Uh, we pay attention to following areas. Number one is IT, mm -hmm. that the information technology that push really high in this area, and that achieve quite significant development. Mm -hmm. And second is biotechnology. But in the biotechnology, two areas. One is uh, pharmaceutical technology, and the bio we call biopharmaceutical. Uh, second is uh, uh, biotechnology in agriculture. That's called, we call GMO and Mm -hmm. The kind of research in the area push quite high in this area. So there's a second high technology. And the third one is new material. Mm -hmm. Number four is new energy. But the new energy are the area in the solar energy, wind energy, and uh, we call biomaterial energy, or people call uh, bio biological energy, called biomass energy. Mm -hmm. And the last is environmental technology. So those areas that we pay so much attention to it. And I, I can see a good progress and I can see a good future to help this country in economic development in the future. Thank you. Dr. Insel. So I'm uh, Tom Insel from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, that's the NIH in the US, which is uh, the government's investment in biomedical research. So I'll really speak about that uh, specifically. The, uh, the NIH has 27 institutes uh, that um, cover a range of areas from uh, cancer, heart disease, uh, brain disorders across the board. We've got uh, one new program that's developed in the last few years, which is called the National Center for Advancing Translational Science. And that gives you some sense of one of the places where we try to confer value, Marriott. This is a place mm -hmm. which tries to fill in this valley of death between basic science as we know it and the development of new medications or new interventions. Uh, and it's really not so much developing the compounds themselves, but working out the process by which that's done, trying to fix the pipeline, trying to fix the, uh, the mechanism of translation as a problem, something that uh, no other sector has done. In general, though, the, the NIH is pretty much evenly divided between its investment in basic science and more applied, uh, more clinical science. And this translational piece is really part of that bridge. Uh, I want to speak just for a moment about the challenges that we face, which are not that different from what you've heard already. Um, we're a large agency for biomedical research that's been a $31 billion is our budget uh, that funds uh, scientists really all around the world. We have a big global health commitment. Um, but the key for us, and I think something I hope we can talk about further in this session, is that the budget has really stalled out. So we've actually seen no growth uh, relative to inflation for over a decade. And in the last 10 years, we've lost about 20% of our purchasing power. Uh, at the very time when uh, healthcare reform has come into play in the US, uh, the costs of health care have uh, continued to grow uh, on an annual basis, and yet our ability to invest in 
the science to bring those costs down has really stalled out. So we've been uh, struggling, I'd say, uh, and we really feel, I think, the pain of this uh, we see in a success rate that's now dropped to about 15% or less. So there's this uh, awful and painful disconnect between supply and demand. When you say success rate, you mean people applying for grants? People applying for grants, their likelihood of getting funded mm -hmm. has dropped. We're seeing young investigators actually getting really discouraged, some leaving the field altogether. Um, what do we do in this case? Part of it is uh, we're seeing at the same time this very interesting growth in uh, private funding. So philanthropy is a major player for um, biomedical research in the U.S. Uh, and now we're seeing um, private industry uh, getting involved even in some basic science projects. So the recent announcement by Google to begin a project looking at brain aging and Alzheimer's disease very interesting. The Allen uh, Institute mm -hmm. uh, has become a major player in neuroscience in my area uh, and has really transformed that field uh, by the uh, commitments that Paul Allen has made uh, with, again, private funding. So we're looking increasingly towards partnerships and saying, well, in a time when we have less and less to work with and others are investing more and more, how do we leverage that? How do we get together with uh, uh, with the pharmaceutical industry, how do we get together with uh, philanthropy, and how do we create value uh, in, through a partnership model, which is quite different from uh, what we've done in the past because we haven't needed to look that, uh, in those directions. Uh, so this is a very interesting time. The whole ecosystem of science funding in the U.S. is shifting. Thank you. Understood? Um, I am Ichite Emamoto. Uh, Japanese former minister yes. for science yes. and technology. And I had uh, been the minister uh, since the inauguration of the current administration uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, December 2012 until a few days ago when the prime minister reshuffled the cabinet. Yes. So based upon my experience as a minister for two years, I'd like to share with you updates of uh, Japan's science and technology and innovation, as well as my own thoughts. Um, the greatest mission of the current Japanese ad administration is, of course, uh, is the restoration of a robust economy. And for this purpose, uh, the government of Japan has been promoting what is called th three arrows of abenomics which are a bold monetary policy, a flexible fiscal policy, and most importantly, growth strategy, which encourages uh, private sector uh, investment. And uh, I think the impacts of the Abenomics has been working uh, quite uh, effectively, uh, as far as we can see the, uh, various uh, indicators. But we should not be too optimistic uh, because the most recent figure of uh, the real uh, GDP growth rate decreased by 7.1% on annual basis due to the effects of the uh, consumption tax rate hike from uh, 5 to 8%. Uh, but I think this is a, a temporary issue because Prime Minister is pretty much determined to uh, promote Abenomics. Well, in fact, uh, at the Davos meeting in January, which accompanied Prime Minister, uh, he, uh, uh, Prime Minister, spoke about uh, Abenomics in the uh, plenary session, uh, which he said he is willing to act like a drilling bit, uh, strong enough to break through the solid rock of vested interests. <laughs> So um, thus attracting uh, 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 interests of many of the participants. And so I did uh, everything I, I could do to uh, contribute to the third all of the economics, namely the growth strategy. I too pushed forward my arrows. Uh, all of them uh, concerned the reinforcement of headquarter function of the uh, uh, science and technology innovation policy uh, of Japan. And firstly, I 
improved the whole uh, uh, budget, uh, whole science and technology budget uh, uh, formation process. And secondly, I, I came up with uh, two new programs uh, in order to promote cross-ministerial cooperations as well as to promote high-risk, high-return uh, research. I also want to mention about the uh, Olympic Games. Uh, in, the, in, in, in the year two, 2020, we will host Tokyo Olympic and uh, Paralympic Games. Uh, and uh, I think we should uh, 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 utilize, we should maximize uh, to, to accelerate, how do you say, uh, uh, measures to address our new challenges, as well as showcase innovation from Japan, uh, attracting wisdom globally. When I say showcase uh, 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 innovation from Japan, uh, I mean the sharing Japanese experiences to uh, address uh, uh, various challenges. For instance, I believe that Japan can greatly contribute to the areas of uh, first robotics, and second, maybe uh, regenerative medicine, and third, I want to say, uh, um, prevention and the mitigation of uh, natural disasters. Um, as a minister, I traveled the world and uh, met in and out of Japan my colleagues, including ministers and also uh, uh, chief government chief scientific advisors and excellent uh, scientists and also CEOs of uh, private companies and so forth. And also I had a chance to visit Silicon Valley, also the Bay Area, three times as minister. And uh, um, uh, during my stay in the ministry, I can say that now because I'm not a minister. During my stay in my office, uh, I sometimes think that uh, well, competition is quite important. But is there any way to come up with some kind of mechanism of international collaboration? Uh, well, after coming back from Silicon Valley, I found out, I felt that it's impossible to build another Silicon Valley. So many countries well, uh, are trying to, to establish uh, to create uh, innovation hubs uh, to uh, win the global competition uh, in their own manners. For instance, in Japan, I was struggling to create a new mechanism of national R&D corporations to uh, 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 connect basic research to commercialization and industrialization. Uh, I think uh, uh, the UK has established Catapults. And also, Germany uh, has uh, Fraunhofer uh, 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 Research Institutes. And uh, um, I learned uh, the word in Silicon Valley competition. As many of you know, competition goes beyond competition and cooperation. Uh, combining uh, the uh, uh, advantage of two. I think this concept of competition, uh, how do you say that? Um, uh, develops, uh, oh my English, develop is English, right? Yes. Develops win <laughs> win uh, uh, scenarios mm -hmm. in which business uh, strives to gain more not necessarily by taking market share or um, profit from a con uh, contender, uh, but by creating a bigger market uh, uh, in the you know, complementary uh, areas. So uh, uh, my question here is, 
whether or not uh, this concept of competition uh, uh, is applicable to the field of science and uh, technology and innovation policy. Uh, you may think that I'm too naive, but I'm not very much naive because I was also in charge of intellectual property strategy as a minister. <laughs> so I know, um, you know uh, IP issues will be very difficult when we try to come up with that kind of mechanism. But I'm always uh, you know, uh, asking if there is any uh, uh, example uh, for competition. Is there any case where uh, not competition, but, but competition uh, led to the world changing uh, innovation? And uh, if we can, uh, if it's possible for us to come up with some kind of uh, international mechanism, what are the roles of NPOs like uh, uh, Gates Melinda Foundation? So um, I'd like to know what other panelists think of this concept of uh, competition. And how about uh, you know, coping with uh, natural disasters? I don't know. So um, uh, that's, a, that's the thing which I'd like to tell you. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing views from other panelists. Thank you. So I think what I've, I think so far we've, we've heard a number of interesting viewpoints. We've, we've heard from smaller to larger um, uh, research pools. We've heard about a variety of funding mechanisms, not all perfectly maybe supported, it sounds like, uh, from the, the, the folks in the room. We've heard about um, how funding is growing in, in certain areas, how it is challenged in other areas, and how there's been some progress in, in translational research. And that um, it, it strikes me that science is such a global endeavor, and there's a lot of cooperation, but the funding is coming very regionally. So the minister here just suggested a couple of interesting things in international collaboration and cooperation. One thing which I want to tell you. Yeah. Co uh, competition is so important. Yes. It's important not to lose competition. Yeah. That's the one thing which I thought. Merit to tell. is always right. going to be right. important right. in science. I quite agree with you. And the rise of philanthropy, also very valuable. So interestingly, we already have a question on Twitter that is a follow-on to these uh, points right here. And if I do this right, it will show up on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, there is an increasing dollars being thrown at science, but what evidence is there of translation into increased societal benefits? Would anyone like to take a stab at that one? So I'll, I'll take a stab. It's, uh, you know, we have this uh, huge project that's done uh, every other decade on the burden of disease. So this is a good example where you can ask what's the impact of investments. Uh, so looking at the global burden of disease, it looks not only at mortality but morbidity. And obviously the chronic non-communicable diseases have emerged as major issues there. Uh, it's 291 diseases and um, also injuries are thrown in as a source of morbidity and mortality. The, the data came out about a year ago uh, from 2010, and the same study had been done in 1990. Uh, and we've been curious about that because people often ask us whether our funding matches that burden of disease. And in fact, it doesn't. We fund by scientific opportunity as well as by what the public health needs are. And those two factors together are better predictors of where we'll invest. But there's a very interesting piece of our funding which is way out of line with everything else. If you do the regression on burden of disease versus funding, the, the piece that's out of line is, is AIDS. So about 10% uh, of our budget, about $3 billion a year, goes to HIV research. And when you look at the, uh, so it's much more than one would predict just based on uh, everything else that we support. But when you look over time, between 1990 and 2010, what's the disorder which dropped the furthest in terms of burden of disease? It's AIDS. It's actually uh, quite remarkable. It went from, I think, number five down to number 31 in terms of morbidity and mortality, and they cut the mortality rate by 50% in that time. So it's a good example to me of uh, not that we're spending too much on HIV research, but that we're not spending enough on everything else, if indeed we could get that kind of return on our investment from other areas, imagine what the, uh, ch the impact would be in public health. So I think we know this works. It worked for HIV. 
Now the question is, how do we raise the bar elsewhere so that we are able to get the same kind of uh, impact in cancer, heart disease, schizophrenia, autism, uh, Alzheimer's? Anyone else like to add to this? So a follow-on question that I have for all of you is now looking ahead a bit, you've, you've described the situations as they currently exist. What are some of the things we can anticipate in the next, say, six months or so? What can we look forward to learning more about? Are we seeing the same trends? Are we seeing, is there anything coming up that will change the, the science picture in your region or in your uh, country? Jump in quickly, uh, Mariette. There's a piece that just came out, an Ernst & Young study, which I found really surprising um, because we've been mostly talking about the doom and gloom of science funding. Uh, but that shows that there's been, uh, in 2013, so this is the most recent data, there's actually a major upswing in private investment, 20% in the U.S., 7% of which is from pharma alone in R&D investment. Uh, so there's something really interesting going on at the same time that we are uh, having all this heartburn about the drop in government support for science. It really is this resurgence like we haven't seen in many, many years in private investment. 41 IPOs last year alone. This is extraordinary. Uh, it tells you that there's a lot of opportunity here. It's just not coming from government. Yeah, I just mentioned that we have about 200 billion U.S. dollars uh, investment in R&D. And surprisingly, as you just mentioned, the first time we saw that over 71% of the money, actually not from government, it's private sector. Mm. And this is, you know, <laughs> it's a socialist country. You don't see, a, <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't see a, so many private companies put money in. Yeah. Always we, the, the government got a tax and whatever. But it's almost the first time we see a, over 70% of R&D budget in China. We, I just mentioned we have 2% of GDP. But that actually, over 70%, over 72.1% money came from private sector in China. So it's, 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 a, it's a really amazing to see a data change. And I'm, I can see in the next few years, it will be continually increase. Like today's uh, Alibaba, doing IPO so successful in USA, they are going to put a quite a good amount of money in those uh, healthcare area, in agriculture area. Uh, I'm very sure that that will be the future. Can I ask a question? Please. You said that 70% of funds are coming from private sector for right. L&D. Yeah. I just want to know uh, if those private companies are investing in, in, in how do you say that, high impact, high risk kind of projects? Because in Japan, we uh, Japanese companies also putting aside so much money for R&D, maybe uh, third largest in, in the world. But the problem is, in case of Japan, the private companies uh, tend not to invest in the high risk you know, kind of projects. Uh, how about that? Uh, yeah, it's a normal situation. In China, you don't expect like a private company to put the money in the basic research. They don't do so. And they don't do a risk business. But in China, you know, you have a, such a big export volume, and you know that what kind of products, high tech products like uh, those, uh, those, those uh, iPad production, you know that you put the money in just uh, to do R and D, you will get you will get payback. So uh, I agree with you. We don't really pay a lot of money into very risk project. Not like in America, when an American doing an IPO, they have some money like venture capital put into a little bit risk. Uh, technology like a development for new drugs. Mm -hmm. They will sometimes you have no idea you will make money or not. But the good things in America, because I was trained in America, I know that you have mechanism to put money into those uh, for clinical trial, phase one, phase two. And normally we don't get money from the private company to put into a new drug development for clinical phase one and phase two. Maybe phase three, they will put money in, but uh, very difficult to get money for phase one and phase two. You know, yeah. the reason why I asked him about this question is that as a policymaker, I'm always, uh, you know, struggling. I mean, I'm facing a kind of a challenge, which, you know, how we should choose innovation to fund, because nobody can predict the future. I think this is a challenge which any policymaker is facing. When I met with uh, Dr. Holdren, he's a science advisor to President Obama, 
just told me that he shared you know same common view. So you know it's a good thing for China maybe to to uh, invest so much money in in, in R and D. But the most important thing is if you can choose a right project you know to fund. So I'm sorry to I I'm sorry to a, no, no, yeah, please, moderate. I, I'm sorry. I like, it's meant to be a conversation, and please do. <laughs> yeah. But I, I'm I'm kind of struck by I'm, I'm just kind of struck by as we watch funding mechanisms shift, their priorities will shift as well. And of course, one of the great um, roles the federal or uh, different governments have played is that long-term investment in basic research, which whether people realize it or not because of the time spans involved, does pay back on average between 30 and 100% on that investment. Please go ahead. I think um, a lot of the basic research, of course, is funded by uh, public money, mm -hmm. and it's uh, spread over many disciplines because you can't really tell which disciplines are going to yield the kind of discoveries that are going to be important for the future. But I think as you develop uh, into translation, developing the ecosystem is very important. Uh, and not just trying to, in my view, pick winners. The ecosystem of um, uh, strong researchers, entrepreneurial uh, scientists, as well as companies. So when companies invest uh, in R&D dollars, they don't just bring R&D dollars, they bring expertise, uh, strong, important questions uh, for companies that they want to solve, and they also help to uh, create the sort of flows of ideas and people between the public and private sector that uh, creates an environment where you can actually do a lot of innovative things. So in a way, you're creating an environment that's self, uh, that is self-assembling and helping to address uh, the most important questions. And finally, just the activity itself, even if uh, you don't have a high rate of success in very successful companies, yet that activity itself is valuable because it uh, attracts people, it employs people, it creates actually a churn of startups and other companies that uh, are valuable for economic development as well. Can I ask again? Can I ask yeah, again? please I'm go sorry. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Japan, the most important, you know, the, mo the biggest challenge is how we, uh, uh, as, I, as I said in my speech, uh, uh, connect uh, basic research to, to uh, you know, uh, a value. I mean, commercialization and also uh, industrialization. Uh, well, it's quite unfortunate, but in Japan, uh, we don't have a mature uh, venture capital environment. Uh, so um, uh, we don't have, uh, you know, IT venture companies uh, in the US, uh, those in the Silicon Valley. So that's the reason why I was struggling to create a new mechanism of R&D National and the corporations to 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 how do you say that to be uh, be, be uh, to work as a bridge uh, between uh, academia and uh, business. Uh, how about Singapore? Singapore has a venture companies or <coughs> what? Which? We do have some, but I think beyond that, uh, there are three factors I think which are important. One is people, uh, encouraging the flow of people between academia, business, policymakers back to academia because. A lot of things are based on personal relationships. Mm -hmm. So creating that flow of people, students, is actually very vital for the whole process. The second is co-location. We find that physical co-location is very important because it stimulates a lot of spillover of ideas. It uh, helps with the movement of people. So when you, we co-locate industry mm -hmm. with uh, research uh, institutions, uh, with the university, in order to promote that flow, and the third is uh, we also have active steps to try and organize partnerships uh, that bring together different types of research within Singapore in partnership with industry, uh, with industry defining many of the problems they really want to try and tackle. I think we'd also like to turn to some of the audience questions. And um, before we do that, I have another one from Twitter that I'd like to toss out. So we're going to change gears a little bit, I think, from... Uh, some of the funding frameworks to some other science-related questions when we think about the global science outlook. And I have one here from my colleague at Gerstner at Nature on Twitter saying, could data be the currency of a new era of global scientific cooperation? Is there something there to work on? Well, maybe I can take uh, this on. I think, uh, of course, uh, big data is, uh, is becoming 
uh, really a, a very sensitive issue and uh, which really will mobilize a lot of attention, probably a lot of investment. But I think one has to be very careful that uh, uh, big data covers uh, many different situations and many different uh, potential uses and many also, um, I mean, the, the process by which this can be dealt with can be very different from one field to the other. And the reason for this is that there, there are already some areas where sharing data is actually just a, a solved problem. I mean, typically, certain people actually created the World Wide Web exactly to, to share right. data. Exactly. And actually, they have been, uh, I mean, using data intensively and even selection of data uh, remarkably. And uh, so we, we know that. In some other areas, of course, the, I mean, I'm not a biologist, so it should be a biologist to talk about this, but clearly, I mean, the question of sharing data in biology is much more sensitive because uh, the more we go and the better we have uh, processes to analyze data, something which at some stage is clearly uh, or comfortable with sharing data because it's not uh, giving any uh, privacy issue. And then maybe five years down the line, you realize that actually with the data collected, you can really actually uh, retrieve uh, private uh, information. So then how can you deal with such an evolution in the, the knowledge uh, which really enables you to really, uh, the same data at some point are safe from the point of view of uh, privacy and then become unsafe later on. So this is a very major issue which is extremely diffi difficult to address. And then uh, also the other part which has to do with the organization of research and its financing. For the moment there are a number of areas in which the, the of course people deal with data but the whole point of uh, making them available which suppose some kind of a common, um, a common framework, common uh, really standards is something which is not dealt with and even the, the professions of people dealing with this and making this available don't exist and the support for them and the money to support them don't, doesn't exist. So I think uh, of course this is going to be an issue but I would be very worried if again this has happened already with open access in some way the uh, position taken at the political level are so uniform that they don't realize that you are dealing with a so different questions with so different problems behind them and even if the idea and the dynamics and the incentive of having uh, shared data is, uh, I think, something which is worth being discussed. It should, be, uh, it should not be actually uh, fooled by the, the belief that this is just one problem. It's many different problems with many different dimensions and many different issues behind it. So I think uh, it's something which uh, will be on the agenda of many people, but I think it's very critical that it, actually, as in many areas of science, the diversity of the practices of science is recognized, identified, and properly dealt with. So we've I, taken, if I can just yeah, add, I mean, this has become a huge issue for us. We've yeah. just created a whole new uh, initiative around big data and brought in some additional talent for this. And I completely agree that uh, there's a, a level of building capacity, building expertise, and there's a whole series of issues that need to be scientifically wrestled with here. Just wanted to share an experience I've had in the last year, a couple of years, that's really surprised me, and that is in going out, working increasingly with the private sector. I've actually found, much to my amazement, that often there's more data sharing in the private sector than there is in the academic sector. Hmm. That for many academics, data is their only source of equity. That's where they have an opportunity for promotion and for uh, something that they can uh, actually use for their own individual career. And so uh, getting the academic sector to share data turns out to be and sometimes a greater challenge. Uh, at least in the private sector, they can identify areas that they call pre-competitive, where everybody benefits. And we have a whole program and sharing uh, data for biomarker development, because every company needs that to help with new diagnostics. But Getting the academics on board, uh, we'll do it. We've just put out a new uh, genomic data sharing policy. So I think genomic data are easier to share and some of the issues you bring up are a little bit um, simpler for genomic data. It's more linear, not so many quality control issues. But for other kinds of data, it's going to be, a, I think there's a lot to work out here. It's going to be a challenge and not only issues around privacy, but issues around quality and how it gets used and issues around access. But we're absolutely committed. And to go back to the original question, in the information age, data, data are equity. That, mm -hmm. is the, that is the source of uh, what people can begin to work with and also a great opportunity for sharing and for progress. 
Thank you. I'd, I'd like to invite the audience to also um, share their questions with us. Please identify yourself if you're, um, if you're asking a question and remind you that if you'd like, you can also send in a question by Twitter using the hashtag global science. And if you prefer, you can send an email globalscience at wef.ch. Does anybody have a question? There's one right here. Please wait for the microphone. Thank you. My name is Felix Maradiaga. I'm with the community of young global leaders. And I wanted to uh, hear the perspective of some of the members of the panel on an issue that it's uh, key for capacity building for developing countries, which is the brain drain of young scientists. Mm -hmm. um, what ideas can you share in, in, in the, the paradox of, of uh, funding and helping emerging and young scientists to go to world-class universities, but at the same time tackling the issue of brain drain? Because it's, 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 it's a big issue, at least in Latin America and Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Another kind of equity. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I can answer that question. I, I myself, well, I graduated in Chinese university and then uh, went to America for PhD and then returned back to China. So brain drain situation, and that, like about 20 years ago in China, it was very severe. So you see many students return, oh, well, just to America, to America, just to get a PhD and stay there. And our great Deng Xiaoping mentioned in his private talk or whatever, where well, he said that I, I decided to send a student, young people, to America or to other countries to study. Or well, let's say maybe 80% or over 80% they will stay in America. But if we can get 20% back to China, that would be great for China. Mm -hmm. That the, the year I left the country to America, well, I returned. So it's about over 20% return back to China, make a significant difference, significant difference to Chinese education, science, and technology, even the business. You can see today, all the people, that, like, like, like those CEO, like an entrepreneur, many come from, return back from USA or from other countries, very significant. So brain gen, in, indeed, it, it is a problem for developing country, for those poor countries, because all the those very talented people left country to America or to other countries. It is a situation. But the good thing is every country had to think about the way to build in a mechanism to bring the talents back to your own country. Mm -hmm. So that's a government job. You need to have a funding. You need to have enough funding to bring them back to your own country to do research or create more opportunity for them to have a job, good job in a country. And that will make a country significant different. I, I can feel it. I, I, I very much agree with you. Um, Prime Minister told me when I became a Minister for Science and Technology, I tried to uh, create a kind of hub for, in Japan for attracting a lot of talents from you know, uh, international community, and also try not let the good scientists uh, go outside Japan, but I'm always wondering, if you want to have a, you know, a excellent, how do you say that, a, a, a brain, uh, we have to send so many people to the best place where they can you know, get knowledge. For instance, if uh, the number of young uh, uh, you know, uh, scientists uh, go to Singapore or go to Silicon Valley, uh, when they uh, come back to Japan, we can have, uh, you know, uh, how do you say that, in a sense, bonus. So uh, most important thing is not to not allow them, to, uh, try to prevent them, those young scientists from going abroad, but try to, to kind of, how do you say that, have uh, infrastructure so that they can come back after, uh, you know, getting knowledge. Uh, in the place where they can, you know, uh, be successful. That's my opinion as a, as a policymaker. Okay. I want to add two quick points to the very good question. One is uh, quite often we only look at the outflows, uh, how many people left, but actually it's the balance that's important. For example, uh, people might leave a country, but because of the opportunities that the people left behind see, more of them, young people, go into education, and the net effect could be a much larger pool of uh, talented, educated people than if uh, the opportunities did not exist to go overseas in the first place. So I actually was quite struck when I looked at some of the data that, for example, Germany actually loses quite a lot of scientists to other countries, but it also 
attracts a lot of scientists in. Mm -hmm. So the net effect is that it's still positive. But if you just look at the German outflow, in fact, there are quite a lot of Germans working outside of Germany. And the, 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 apart from the point of re, re, brain recirculation, there's also the network effect. Uh, so when you have all these scientists, researchers overseas, they actually create a very strong network uh, which actually enables capacity building in uh, the, host, the, the originating country, uh, in addition to remittances and other types of economic benefits. So, so I think the situation could be more positive depending on the balance of outflows, inflows. And we always say that science is global, and CERN is maybe the best example. I mm. can't remember how many countries, I think it's 100 countries are represented within CERN. Thousands something of like scientists. Yeah. Thousand, 3,000, 4,000 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, scientists. 4, 4, scientists. But, but, no, members, members. but we don't say as often is that the economic return belongs to the place where the innovation takes place. So location does matter, and it does make a difference for, um, for countries to make the investment at home to ensure that there'll be innovation there. So your question's a really important one for countries that haven't yet made that investment. Mm -hmm. Ironically, in the States, which has been the place where people have been coming for so long, we are the, maybe the source of some of the brain drain, we're actually arguing that we're losing people now because we're not making the investment we need to. This, invest, this argument about invest at home for economic gain is one we're making to our own government. Uh, to try to get them to continue the investment that they had made historically, and it's not there currently. So uh, it's, uh, we're somewhat in the same boat at this point. Thank you. I think we had a question over here. Just been waiting patiently. <coughs> oh, and then one back here. Bhaskar Chakravarti, Senior Associate Dean at the uh, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Um, I have a hypothesis, which is the 20th century, uh, we had um, plenty of uh, conflict. You know two wars and a Cold War, uh, which was not a good thing. But from the perspective of science, it was actually pretty good because uh, it gave an impetus and created political will, certainly in the United States and similarly in the Soviet Union and in other parts of the world, to, uh, to fund science, uh, and largely for military reasons, but then there was a spillover effect uh, uh, and, and funding of fundamental uh, research in a variety of fields, whether it was in government labs or in industrial labs. 21st century, uh, we don't have the same kinds of conflict. So we have the, the situation where Congress does not, uh, does not unite behind you know, some kind of a Sputnik moment or some kind of a war moment. And there are different kinds of wars being fought now. And I'm wondering whether we, you know, whether that's a real problem and whether I'm not suggesting that we need another big, a, a third world war, but is, is that an issue? And do we need some kind of a rallying moment uh, for this century? So I'll speak as the U.S. Uh, representative. I, you know, I think that for this Congress and the ones that have preceded it, uh, there's um, a very urgent focus on the deficit. So all decisions are made with respect to how to balance the budget. Uh, and we're about to go into this whole period of what's called sequestration, which was a kind of mindless cutting of the budget by 5% every year until things are balanced. We had a two-year uh, basically relief from that process, but that two years is going to be up in 2016 unless somebody does something about it, so we'll have another 5% cut in the NIH budget. Uh, I don't think that there's, I, I'm not sure that a war would do it, but I don't think there's anything that has convinced uh, the, the Congress in the US uh, that there's anything more important than balancing the budget, uh, irrespective of what cost that makes. And I, you know, it gets to a point that I think we just don't make well enough anywhere, and that is that science is an investment. It's not a cost. That you invest in science to avoid future costs, whether those are costs <coughs> in healthcare or whether those are uh, costs in other parts of society where you have needs. Uh, and we did understand that in the past, and we made those decisions, as you said, in the 20th century to great benefit. Even in investments in basic science where there wasn't a clear application in mind, and those were often the ones that had the greatest impact. Um, it's been difficult to keep that 
in the debate currently when everything is about simply how do you balance the numbers and ensure that government is smaller, we're spending less, and that we're um, killing the deficit? I, I actually I can't believe that we're very nearly out of time. So I'm, I'm going to ask her one more quick question. I think someone was waiting patiently back here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Katerina Fotopoulou, UCL, and Young Scientist here, and also ERC grantee. So I wanted to ask you, as largely policy uh, makers are responsible for policy and funding in your respective um, locations, what innovation um, can we have in policy so that we mediate funding not just across countries but across industry and academia? So, of course, you talked about, for example, differences between uh, first phase, second phase, and third phase, and we all know basic research needs help from policymakers. But what I mean is within the same project. So, for example, sometimes the problem is that industry has certain costs it's willing to fund and not others. Um, and vice versa. So what kind of innovation can we come up to facilitate the relationship between academia and industry on the same project? Um, we have uh, in the, the data I just mentioned to you that private investment increased dramatically in China. That's because the policy changed. Chinese government decided to change the policy by uh, changing original rule that any private company, if you want to put money into academic academic research and development, especially if you want to put the money into clinical phase one, phase two. And then the tax, the year tax will be cut. So it, if you uh, pay like a 10 million, let's say 10 million RMB into the laboratory, then the years, the 10 million RMB tax will be cut. You don't need to pay. Let's say you pay that, but you will get reimbursed. And that make a significant change because many companies feel like, this is good. Anyhow, I did not you know, lose money. I just, or otherwise money will go to government. But the government say, if your money can go to private, well, forget it, no tax, or cut the tax. So this is pro like we call innovation, or the policy. I guess that learned from America. American being done a long time ago. They're doing very well in, uh, in encouraging the private sector to put money in and then connect it. Um, I actually think we're, we're just about out of time here, but this is a, actually a, a nice point to end on. Um, you, Dr. And so you just called science an investment, China clearly investing heavily. Mm. It, it seems to me, and let, let's say I hope this, that, that uh, China's investment will be inspiring to people um, in other countries as they consider what kind of policy frameworks they might need or which ways they might want to decide to invest in science. So I think this has been a lovely discussion in the latter half of it. We talked a lot about equity, but different kinds of equity. We talked about investment matching benefits in many ways. So we're seeing investment, we're seeing different kinds of benefits come out of that. We talked about equity of data and some of the challenges around this. And we talked about uh, equity of, of brains. And I, I love this term, brain recirculation, rather than brain drain. And I think um, one of the things that's lovely is we've got a lot of terrific brains in this room. And it seems to me that if anybody could solve some of the challenges of moving science and innovation productively forward, we've got the right people in the room right now. So thank you very much for a lovely conversation. Thank you.